Consider the lilies they don't toll nor spin And there's not a king with more splendor than them Consider the sparrows they don't plant nor sow but they're fed by the master who watches them grow. We have a heavenly Father above with eyes full of mercy and a heart full of love. Consider the lilies, and then you will know. May I introduce you to this friend of mine, who hangs out the stars and tells the sun when to shine. He kisses the flowers each morning with dew, but he's not too busy to care about you. We have a heavenly Father above with us full of mercy and a heart full of love. He really cares when your head is bowed low. Consider the lilies We've been looking at studies on the Holy Spirit, and we've got to the place where we've been looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, someone had uh, categorized them in three different areas, or three different categories. And one was the speaking gifts of the Spirit. That is, God has gifted people to preach the Word of God, and to teach the Word of God, and exhort people, the exhortation. So we have preaching, teaching, and exhortation. These are the speaking gifts. And then there are, uh, there are the serving gifts. God has given people uh, the ability to serve in different capacities. Not everybody can serve in the same way, but we can all serve. And so God has given us, and we didn't look at all those. But then we started looking at the sign gifts, the sign gifts. And uh, Brother Bill Turley uh, did Wednesday night, last Wednesday night, he talked about uh, the sign gifts of tongues and he dealt a little bit with that with that and um, But we're gonna look at uh, the gifts of healing and uh, it was just good news to hear brother Cliff about his body being healed of this uh, uh, What was it you had kidney kidney failure and uh, and then uh, Kathy back there she talked about her friend uh, God healed him and uh, so it's good to know that God still is in the healing business. Amen. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. In our last study, we looked at uh, why, uh, we started looking at why God sins or why God allows sickness or physical illnesses, physical ailments, and so forth. Why does God allow that? Why does God send that in some cases? And we, of course, told you out of the scriptures that physical healing is not in the atonement. It's not in the atonement. And so a lot of people use that with his stripes, we are healed. Now look, all of us, if you're, how many of you saved? Say amen. Lord. 
Well, if you're saved, you're going to get healed one of these days completely. I mean, I'm telling you, you won't even have a sniffle. <laughs> Amen. And we're all going to be completely healed. We're all going to have a brand new glorified body. Now, you talk about healing. There it is right there. And so, but until then, guess what? We're all going to get sick. And if, even if we do get healed, we're going to get sick again. I don't mean to discourage you, Brother Clip. But everybody in the Bible that Jesus healed, they died. They sure did. And so, but, but thank God that God is still in the healing business. And we're going to look at some things about, before we can talk about healing, let's talk about sickness. Okay, we looked at that. Now, remember last study, we, uh, that was a week and a half, that was a week before last. Um, Miriam, Moses' sister, was struck down with leprosy because of sin. She began to criticize God. She began to criticize Actually, she criticized her brother for marrying an Ethiopian woman. And uh, God simply said, you don't talk about another man's wife like that. And uh, so he struck her down with leprosy. But he also healed her too. And then we, we looked at those who, um, who perverted the Lord's Supper. Remember what the Bible says about that? The Bible says uh, because they were perverting the Lord's Supper, many of them were sick among you, he says, and many of them sleep or they died. Because they misused the Lord's Supper. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter number 28. And we're going to look at proof from the scripture that God actually does send sickness or he allows sickness. Deuteronomy 28, look at verse number 58. Talking to his people, Israel. He says, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and what? Sore sicknesses and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of of the Lord thy God. God says because you would not obey me. He says I'll send plagues. I'll send sore sicknesses. So I firmly believe. That God can. Does. Has. Send sickness upon people. Because of sin. Let's go to Micah. The book of Micah. Micah chapter number 6. I, I didn't have it marked. But I turned right to it. But I'll wait till you get there. Okay. Micah chapter number 6. Micah chapter number 6. And let's look at verse number 12. Micah chapter 6 and verse number 12. Are you there? Okay. We there? Micah chapter 6 verse number 12. For the rich man, for the rich men thereof are full of violence and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. So let me, let me just say this. Not all sickness is because of sin, but some of it is. And God, and God does send sickness because of sin. Now, let me just say this before we go any further. Some of, the, some, of the, some of the greatest Christians that ever walked the face of this earth were some of the most sickest of Christians that walked the face of this earth. Just because, I mean, think, think about Fanny Crosby, blind, but there has never been a greater songwriter. So, don't get the idea, like, like some religions will say, well, if, if, you, if, 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 you weren't, uh, if you weren't so far away from God, you wouldn't be sick. That's not the case. 
Sometimes it's just completely the opposite. We'll see that in just a second. So, number one, God sends sickness because of, as a judgment upon sin. Well, let's look at something else. Now, we looked at this the week before last, but let's go back to Exodus chapter number four. Exodus chapter number four. And let's look at Moses for just a minute. The second reason that God allows or sends sickness is for Jesus to get the glory. For Jesus to get the glory. Exodus chapter number four. Look at verse number six. Exodus four and six. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, unto Moses, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Now, I said this, that, um, that Moses was the first man in the Bible who got sick and the first man in the Bible that was healed. And so, verse number seven, and he says, put thine hand into thy, thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Now, verse eight, and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee. Neither hearken to the voice of the first sign. Did you know a sign has a voice? He said there's a voice of the first sign. That they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass if they will not believe also these two signs. Neither hearken unto thy, thy voice. Thou shalt take, that thou shalt take of the water of the river. Pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. So Moses uh, God said, the reason that I want you to do this, the reason I want you to take my people uh, out of Egypt, uh, first of all, the Jews require a sign. And he says, if they'll not believe the voice of the first sign, they need to hearken to the voice of the latter sign. The Bible says the reason that uh, he wants to bring them out is that they will believe. That they will believe. Now, so in order... God's going to send, God sent sickness here, as a matter of fact, leprosy, in order that his people will believe. In order for Jesus really to get the glory. The, the Jews require a sign, they still do. Let's look at one in the New Testament now, or actually two in the New Testament. This is more familiar to you. Lazarus, John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11. Why does God allow sickness? Why does God send sickness? Not only for judgment upon sin, but for Jesus to get the glory. John chapter number 11. You know the story. Verse number 1. All right, verse 1. Here we go. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Did you see what, what Jesus just said? He said, This sickness is not unto death, but Lazarus did die, didn't he? But he didn't stay dead very long. He was dead four days. Jesus rose him, from, uh, called him out of that grave. But Lazarus did not get sick and die because of some sin that we're looking at. Because he was disobedient. The Bible says that he was sick so that Jesus would get the glory. So not all sickness is because of sin. Some of it may be. That it may bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Lazarus died for the same reason that Moses was diseased. For the glory of God. Now look at John chapter number 12. John chapter 12. Look at verse number 11. Well verse 10. They came to see Lazarus also in verse number 9. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. You know, I thought about that. You know, if Lazarus wanted to have been some kind of a wise guy, he could have said, well, go ahead. Jesus will raise me again. <laughs> of course, he didn't do that. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Now, isn't that amazing that Lazarus had died 
He was sick. He died. Jesus rose him again. And, and man, they come to see Lazarus. And of course, they came to see Jesus. But look at verse number 11 here. It says, because that by reason of him, who? Lazarus. But by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So had not, look, had not Lazarus gotten sick, he would not have died. And had he not have died, Jesus would not have raised him from the dead. And had not Jesus raised him from the dead, many people would not have believed on Jesus. But because Lazarus was sick and was and died and raised from the dead, Jesus got the glory. Now, isn't that amazing? So, what well, is to me, I don't know if it's you or not, it's amazing to me. <laughs> but, so, in order for Je Jesus, look, God allows sickness in order for his son to get the glory. Let me show you another one. John chapter number 9. We're in the book of John. Let's go to John chapter number 9, verse number 1. John 9 and verse number 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but what? But that the works of God should be manif made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, um, you, you remember what happen, happens here as we, as we look at this. Look at verse number uh, 6 now. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came see. Now, Jesus made clay out of his spittle and the ground. Now, can you think of another time when Jesus stooped down or God stooped down and used ground to make something? We go back to Genesis chapter 1, chapter number 2. That's what he did. He formed a man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. But I'm interested just for a minute, just to kind of chase a little rabbit here. I'm interested in the, in the word spit. <laughs> now, they, they used to tell, or mama used, well, really mom and dad used, didn't say much about us spitting. They just didn't want to, us to do it inside the house <laughs> when we were growing up. But that's what little boys did. I mean, we thought it was cool, by the way, just to go around spit. You know, I, I don't know why. But do you know that in the Bible, if a leper, if a leprous man would spit on somebody, they would be unclean. They would be unclean. I guess that's why they... Uh, the, the government says that we ought to wear these masks in case we decide we want to spit on somebody. <laughs> so I, I don't know. But there was something else in connection with spit. All right? Let's go to Numbers and we'll follow this out. All right? Just a little sidetrack here. Numbers chapter 12. Let's look at Numbers chapter 12. We had mentioned this before. But in Numbers chapter 12... And if you'll look at verse number 14, I think it is. Verse number 14. Numbers 12 and verse number 14. This is about Miriam. Remember, she was, uh, of course, she had leprosy. And they, Israel had to stop. They couldn't go anywhere until she was healed. And verse number 14 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? So spitting was considered to be shameful. You see that? Look what it says. Should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. After that, let her be received in again. So she was shut out of the camp seven days. They couldn't go anywhere. Let's look at another one. Deuteronomy chapter number 25. Here's a custom that we see. In Deuteronomy chapter number 25. 
We're talking about spitting of all subjects, of all topics tonight. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 25. Verse number 5. Deuteronomy 25, verse number 5. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. Well, thank God that's not the custom of today in America. Amen. <laughs> so. and, it shall, and it shall be, verse 6, that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead. That his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his, you know, it, I mean, it was his choice. He didn't have to. And if he didn't want to, here's what happens. Then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. Now, that was her reason. He may have had another reason why he didn't want her. Amen? Now, I'm not going to give you a multiple choice. Thing. But he, he just refused. He said, now watch. And here's what she says. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her. Then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. <laughs> I guess if he really didn't want her, a spit in the face is not so bad. But this also spoke of shame. He would not do his duty of a husband's brother. All right. Let's look at Job chapter number 30. Job chapter 30. Let's look at verse number 10. Job 30 and verse number 10. And then I'll give you one that you were really familiar with. Job 30 and verse number 10. Now, remember what Job went through. Remember, Job lost everything. Lost his family, uh, lost his livestock, lost his living, lost everything. And some so-called friends decided to come along and tell him what his problem was. And it would have been good if he had lost them too. Amen. But look what it says. They, they abhor me. They, who are they? Verse number one. But now they are younger but now they that are younger than I have me in derision. He's talking about younger people here. They abhor me, verse 10. They flee far from me and spare not to spit in my face. Now here was people, here, here was, look, the young people used to respect old Job. They used to honor him. But now that he's in the shape that he's in, they come by him, they look down upon him, they abhor him, and they spit in his face. You know what Isaiah 50 says in verse number 6, prophesying about Jesus, it says this, that he hid not his face from shame and spitting. So in the Bible, spitting had to do with shame. And our Savior took shame, our shame, upon his body, upon his life. In each of these three cases, though, that we just looked at, Moses and, and, and so forth, who got the glory? Who did the healing, by the way? God did the healing. Who got the glory? God got the glory. Now, if that's the case, does not the Bible says that Jesus is the mediator between God and men? Look, we go to God through Jesus for salvation. We go to God through Jesus for answered prayer. Should not we go to God through Jesus for healing? I think we should. Since he is the mediator. 
So God sends or he allows sickness because of judgment upon sin. Secondly, in order that Jesus gets the glory. But thirdly, for the joy and the maturing of the saint. You say, you mean to tell me that sickness will bring, bring joy in my life? It may not bring a lot of joy. It can bring you some joy, but it certainly will bring maturing in your life if you handle it the right way. Who handled it the right way? Well, Romans 5 tells us that Paul did. Let's go to Romans 5. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter, I think it's Romans chapter 5 that we need to look at. Verse number 1 through 5. Romans 5. Now, Romans 5, therefore, great verse, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, watch this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Glory in tribulations? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Knowing that, here it is, tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're going to mature as a saint, if you're going to mature in your Christian life, these steps must take place in your life. You know what we want? We want a life of ease as Christians. We don't want no problems. We don't want no sickness. We don't want, we don't want no heartaches. But that's not the way you're going to grow and mature in the Lord. You're going to have tribulation. You say, but I want patience. Well, tribulation worketh patience. You say, but, but, but then, but, but then I, I, need to, I need to really experience the Christian life. Well, tribulation, patience, patience worketh experience. How do you know if you're going to have patience unless you experience difficulty? Yeah, you know what? We all want patience, but we don't want the, <laughs> we don't want the um, working of what it takes to get patient. I'm telling you what, you want patience, go to Walmart. <laughs> That's tribulation. Tribulation work of patience. And man, I'm going to tell you, you better be prayed up before you go in there. Look, when I go to Walmart, I try to wear a t-shirt or something that has something about the gospel on it. Because if in my mind I'm getting ready to lose my patience, I get ready, I look down my shirt. Oh, I've got Trinity Baptist Church. I better watch it. Somebody's going to say. <laughs> Look, if I'm going to go to Walmart, I'll get me another shirt that says such and such Episcopalian shirt. Okay. Wear another. No, never mind. But look, here Paul knew, Paul knew that he had changed. On the road to Damascus, when he met Jesus in Acts chapter number 9, he knew he had changed. There's no doubt about that. But he also knew that he still had this old flesh. Just two chapters over in Romans chapter number 7, he has to deal with that. He says, whenever I want to do good, evil is present with me. He said, I'm finding a struggle. I'm finding it difficult. And by the way, you will. Look, if you're saved, you still carry this flesh around with you. In fact, look at Romans 7. Look at the last verse of Romans chapter number 7. Or the last two verses. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Won't you be glad when you get rid of this body of death? Well, we are. So verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, when I read these virtues in Romans chapter number five, these virtues are built one upon the other and built in the order given. We've got to follow it as it is. Now, let's go and look at Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 um, Corinthians chapter number 12. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Remember, the reason that God allows sickness or God sends sickness 
It is for the maturing and the joy in the life of the believer. Now, at the time, you don't, you don't throw a party because you get sick. You don't have a lot of joy because you get sick. But look here in Paul's case. In Paul's case. And it can be in our case too. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Verse number 5. <clears throat> verse number 5. Of such and one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory but in mine infirmities. What's Paul say? I'm going to glory in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory... I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that, or that he heareth of me. Now verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, let's look at five things real quickly here. Number one, God allowed Satan to turn one of his messengers on Paul. In fact, Paul said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So God allowed that to happen. This messenger was allowed to buffet him. Now, can you, can you take Paul's life here and compare it with somebody in the Old Testament? How about Job? Wasn't, wasn't Job, what, did not God allow uh, death in Job's situation, the death of his family? Did not uh, God allow uh, the loss of materials? Sure. Did not God allow suffering in Job's life? God allowed all that. So here we have the Apostle Paul, and God allowed Satan to turn one of his messengers on him and said, there he is. And the Bible says that this messenger was allowed to buffet Paul. Now that word is used three times in the Bible, I think. Three times. It means to wrap with the fist. It mean, actually, it means to hit with the fist. The messenger of Satan to buffet him. Webster says it is to strike with a hand or fist. It was used on Christ. You remember they would buffet. They would spit on Christ. They would buffet him. They would hit him with their fist. Here it was used on Paul. You know what? It's, Peter talks about it in the letters of Peter, in the epistles of Peter. He, he says it this way. If ye be buffeted for your faults. What glory is that? What's glo what glory is in that? So the word's used three different times. But Paul prays three times for healing. Paul prays that this would be taken away from him. Three times. Now, if there was anybody other than Christ that I would say was a prayer warrior and that got his prayers answered, to me it had to be a, the Apostle Paul. But Paul prayed three times. Think about that. Three times that this would depart from me. But God says no. God says I'm going to give you grace sufficient for what you're going through. Now look. Paul prays three times for healing. But God gave him sufficient grace. That word sufficient is an interesting word. It means to be satisfactory. It means to be content. It means to be enough. Now, if you're in Paul's situation, the messenger of Satan to buffet you, and you pray three times, Lord, take that away from me. Take that away from me. Take the away. God says, no, I'm just going to give you grace sufficient. Grace that's satisfactory. Grace that is enough. Webster says that the word sufficient means Equal to the end proposed. Adequate to the wants. Does not Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I like what the little boy said. He quoted it a little bit different. He said, The Lord is my shepherd, and he's all I want. And so, instead of being healed, 
Paul would rather have the power of Christ upon his life. Look at verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most, and here's what Paul says, Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I think, I think we need to be honest. And, and, and at least I want to be honest. I would, look, I would rather, I would rather be crippled up and have the power of God upon my life than to be perfectly healthy and people and, and, and not have God's power. I, I mean that. I mean that. Look, we're all going to die. Wouldn't you rather be a prayer warrior? Wouldn't you rather be someone that the power of God's upon your life than to be perfectly healthy and wealthy and wise and just as dry as last year's bird's nest? Man, I want God's power in my life, don't you? You know how you get that? Sometimes it comes through suffering. But I'm going to tell you what. You're going to glory in the power of God upon your life, even though you have to suffer. And it will bring maturity and joy in your life. And people will not understand that. They'll not understand it. You ask me why I'm happy, I'll tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And, and look, some of, the greatest, some of the greatest preachers that ever preached on this earth were, were just bound with infirmities. Who was the fellow that came out of uh, Falwell's church that had cerebral palsy? Y'all know who I'm talking about? What was his name? David Green. David Green. Some of you had heard his testimony. Some of you saw it on TV. But he talked about... I mean, if you'd never seen that guy, man, it's even hard to understand him. How many of you know who I'm talking about? You, you've seen. Amen. But I like what he said one time. He said there was a lost man watching the Jerry Falwell you know, his program, and he happened to be preaching. He said he's going through channels, just flipping, trying to find something. Lost man on Sunday morning, trying to find something to watch on TV. And all of a sudden, he finds this guy that's all twisted up and knotted up, and he stops. And he watches that guy. And he thought, well, and he flips on through. But he keeps thinking about that guy. He flips it back and keeps watching David ring. And he ends up getting saved, trusting Christ as his Savior. And he said that would not have happened if David ring had a perfect body. He said, but because he was all twisted up, had cerebral palsy. Here's what David ring said. I thank God for cerebral palsy. You talk about somebody who had joy in his life and maturity in his life. But God allows that sometimes to bring maturity and to bring joy in your life. You know why? Because we're going to get a brand new body regardless. One of these days. And then verse 10. Notice the pleasure taken. Therefore I take pleasure. What brings you pleasure, Paul? Oh man, you just give me a boat. And you just give me a, a nice house. And you just, you no, know, Paul says, you know what makes me happy? You know what brings me joy? You know what brings me pleasure? Infirmities. Paul, are you crazy? No, I'm just getting closer and closer to God. <laughs> that I may know him, Paul says. And the what? The fellowship of his suffering. Well, the greatest thing that the Lord can do for some of his children is to afflict the flesh in order to prevent the flesh from gaining victory over the spirit. And I'm telling you, there's a battle all the time. Who are you going to let win? It's up to you. Who are you going to let win? Now, we don't have time to get into the last one. But the fourth reason for sickness, I believe it comes all the way Back to the Garden of Eden because of the curse. I believe that's the reason we have so much sickness and so many diseases. I, it, got, has, it goes all the way back to the curse. God cursed the ground. God cursed Satan. God cursed, brought a curse upon mankind. And we're still cursed to this day. 
So I'm going to tell you what. But Jesus became a curse for us. It's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So he took our sins and our sorrows and all of the curse upon his body and died for our sins. So that we can live in a world one day. In that, that other world. The glorious world. The world of heaven. Amen. Without any disease. Without any heartaches. Without any curse whatsoever. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. 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 Father thank you. For allowing us to see some things about healing. and About sickness. and Help us to understand Father. That this thing of sickness. And this thing even of healing. Is just temporary for the child of God. We're looking for a day. Lord, that you'll come in the clouds. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Father, help us. Help us to really get our eyes and our hearts on things that really matter. The saving the lost souls. Being witnesses for you. Magnifying Jesus in our life. We ask, dear God, that you would be with us. If there's one here that needs to be saved. We pray that you would save them for the glory of God. You can In Jesus' live name, as we pray. You please, Amen. Amen. But you must pay the cost. And the highway to heaven still goes by the cross.